Who's that 15 pages? And we're going to be here all night. Assalamu alaikum. It's always a pleasure to um, come to a iftar dinner and share the bridge of the gap between Aboriginal community and uh, the Islamic community or the Muslim community. <coughs> So yes, my name is Andrew Garvey, but my middle name is Hassan. So proud of the Wurundjeri uh, clansmen of the Woiwurrung people. And also, as uh, was said, uh, an Aboriginal Muslim Australia. I became a Muslim in uh, 1995, so it's quite some time ago. So it's a pleasure for me to be here tonight at the University's Melbourne Iftar Dinner. The University of Melbourne's Iftar Dinner. So I'm humbled to provide a welcome to the country, but also as an elder of the Wurundjeri people and as a Muslim. I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, uh, the Australian Intercultural uh, Society for helping to support tonight's dinner with the Melbourne University. There's a lot of similarities between Aboriginal spirituality and society and that of Islam. There's the one creator spirit, the belief in the one creator. The separate men's and women's business. Different cultural practices were held with women, becoming girls becoming women, boys becoming men, quite separate. When we uh, sit around a campfire, women would be over there and the men would be over there. A lot of similarities to how we do business in uh, Muslim society as well. Family traditions around country. We have a strong knowledge of our country and we take care of it. There's issues around marriage, you know, planned marriages, um, usually brought about by a gathering, a customary practice of gathering, <coughs> and arrangements would be made. A respect for elders as knowledge holders and authority, cultural authority. They provide their wisdom. In Islam, this is called shura. Elders would get together as a group to plan as a council for the community, but as individuals of a family, they provide advice to their family. There were six clan groups belonged to the Wurrung. We had an oral history. Well, a lot of black folks should come to university to learn more sort of an An oral history passed out from generation to generation. We believe in what our ancestors and our elders say as the truth, because what they're telling us is the truth. Because we didn't have that written history, we need to believe what they say. So everybody sitting around a campfire at night would share stories. Elders would share stories. When elders speak, this is a, a strong <coughs> motto in the Aboriginal community, when elders speak, we listen. And so it's important for uh, other elders that are in the room tonight, other than me, uh, to, um, to hear that as well, because they should have that respect for their life history and their families. Let's cast our mind back a, a, a couple of decades, a couple of centuries actually. 1835, you know what happened in Melbourne in 1835? We had John Matman come to town and he wanted to claim some uh, territory. He wasn't authorised to have a treaty, but he went ahead and did that anyway with some of our elders <coughs> near the Mary Creek. That document was written in longhand in English, prose with common law accents. I've got a copy of it at home. I was lucky to get a copy of it from the Melbourne Museum. I read it quite a few times and it's like, mm, this guy was really doing people a deal. What the document didn't have in it expressed cultural law from our people. Our ancestors didn't have any of that conversation because it wasn't translated. The document basically gave him all the rights of ownership to the lands that he had given some implements to trade. Some blankets, some tea, some hatchets, a few other things. In today's money, that's really negligible. What our ancestors understood from that conversation, because he was setting himself up to be the first property developer in Melbourne. You're supposed to laugh at that, that was a joke. <laughs> what our ancestors understood from that limited translation was that 
he sought a short-term occupancy. And our, um, our elders understood and agreed to that to a Tandurum. A Tandurum was a, a temporary use of land agreement where you have to live and survive here for a week or two and once you're right and you can get yourself back together, you can sort of head off back to where you're from. He didn't. He, he left, but more people came back. So the document that he actually had signed by people was void at the very start. Why? Because he actually held those people's hands to draw their name. Because they never went to school, they'd never held a pen in their life, and they didn't know how to write their name, they never had a pen license. So, how did they scribe their name? They didn't, because he held their name, he held their hand. In anybody's language, that's probably a word document, yeah? So the temporary use of the land. We expected uh, temporary visitor visas being ac accessed. Unfortunately, they became permanent visas. So our traditional country is from the Werribee River in the west, north along its flow to the headwaters, um, to the Great Dividing Range, and then easterly to Mount Borbor, and then south to, through Bunyip, and down through to Mordialic Creek. We did not own the land as a concept. We were custodians of the land. We looked after it. So like our mother, it cares for us, provides, uh, gives us food, resources, shelter. <coughs> and these were provided to our ancestors for thousands of years. So we took care of the land and the waterways, only using what we needed. So it took care of us, because we didn't take and take and take. So from the tips of the leaves to the roots of the trees in the ground, we share our country with you now. I'll just touch on another point. Not long after Batman uh, came to town and left, got told off by the governor of another community. 1839 comes along, guess what happened there? A few people have heard this, a few of my IFTA welcomes lately, but I'll remind everybody because everybody's new to this one. Last tracts of land of our traditional country were sold from under us, between the Plenty River to the Werribee River. We've never ceded our sovereign rights to our country, nor did we sell it or give it away. So how did a government, which was not in this place, have the authority to sell our land? I've got more schools here, but I might want to work that one out. It was sold in only two years, from 1839 to 1841, to just 29 men, British men. One of them was a guy by the name of Farquhar McRae, of Scottish heritage, who came from Jamaica. His family had a sugarcane plantation there, and at any one time there was 700 West African slaves, half of which were women. In the early 1800s, the British government denounced slavery and paid out people who, to let their slaves go. Much what the, uh, what the uh, prophet, peace be upon him, asked people to do. So Abu Bakr did that on many occasions out of his own purse, paid for a slave to be free and let them go. So McRae came to this land with global slavery money. He named his farm Moreland after the plantation in Jamaica. This is where Moreland Council got its name in 1994. In December 2021, we've been provided with some research about the background of this story. We validated it. And we took that to council in December 21 and asked them to change their name. Because the name Moreland is associated with global slavery, racism, and purposeful dispossession. The council voted and agreed to change the name in 2022. Another took a process to engage with the community and the local government minister supported that action. 
the arts that Wurundjeri rural community be involved in that process. So we thought about researching some names which might be appropriate for that area. There was about seven that we came up with. Our board and our elders decided on three and we put those to council. Council then put those to the community between Brunswick and Coburg and they had over 6,000 responses. They had a number of community engagement opportunities where elders participated with those to communicate with the general community about the background story and why it would be good to change the name. So June 2022, the result came back, Merribeck. Merribeck means rocky country. And they formally changed their name, or became Merribeck City Council on the 26th of September, 2022. This was making things right, or a part of that. Demonstrated and sent a message to the Aboriginal people that their voice was heard that they would be listened to by council and the multicultural community that lives in Merribeck. Not long ago, I watched a YouTube video um, by, um, by Mufti Menk, who did a lecture in the UK about Ramadan. He noted in uh, that speech uh, that Ramadan is an opportunity where our taqwa, our fear of Allah, is heightened and that Allah has forgiveness on sale for the month. Now if we go and do a sale, we like to look at getting the best bang for buck that we can, so we should remind ourselves to do that, to seek forgiveness from our Creator, essentially to get rid of our sins. Allah wants us to seek forgiveness. So when in prostration, we should ask for that mercy and that forgiveness because it's the closest point to God that we are in. Also, the rewards are increased during the fasting month. Not eating brings compassion and control of self. For others who are hungry will have no food, a Muslim must share our food with them, even if they're not a Muslim. What about the homeless? should be compassionate to them as well. Understand there's still 250, 300 rough sleepers in the city of Melbourne, just around the corner every night. We should consider that. Giving will help develop character and strengthen our faith. So may Allah grant all of us faith and patience and good character as we seek to achieve consciousness of Allah. Hopefully people felt that and had an association with the Knight of Power. Now, on to a couple of other points, and I'll scoot through these a bit quick because we've been breathing a bit far. The National Voice of Power, which was been around in the uh, media quite some time. A referendum is being held at the end of the year, October or November, and all you have to do is vote yes or no. I would ask you to consider voting yes. Now there's not enough information out there to guarantee that or to help you understand it or to make me enable you to be confident to say yes. But there is the expectation that there's a process that requires constitutional amendment to have that referendum done. So I would ask to consider the opportunity for that constitutional change to continue because there's 15 or 16 clauses in the Constitution that discriminate against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A person coming to Australia, becoming a citizen, can vote in the next general election without anything hanging over their head. And I think this is fair. Do you? No. No? no? <laughs> Thank you very much. It shouldn't be acceptable in this day and age that a constitution discriminates against its first peoples. In relation to the voice, can I refer you to the Indigenous Voice Co-Design Process Report from July 2021. Two years old, the government hasn't done anything about it. 
That was authored by Professor Marsha Langton and Professor Tom Kelmer, co-chairs of the Senior Advisory Group. Have a look at that report, because it's quite detailed. And it's glaringly obvious that the opposition leader, the Liberal Party, didn't, or didn't take those things into consideration when he voiced his opinion the other week, saying it would divide the country. There's nothing in that report that says it would divide the country. It doesn't seek to divide the country. There's lots of parts to that report, and I would ask that you have a look at it, if you haven't already, from your backyard, so that would be good too. But the National Voice would not deliver government programs. It would not provide mediation or facilitation. It would not replace existing organisations. And it will not be an ex next, next escalation point. Oh no, an escalation point. For local and regional operations. It's not a clearinghouse for research. And it wouldn't undertake program evaluations. So the government should be scared of it. It should be collaborating with it. There is nothing in it that scares people. Anything that I could add, that it should actually have an elders council that could provide cultural oversight, as is being arranged for the uh, Treaty of Victoria. I won't go into that too much. You can research that yourselves. But, as we say, we acknowledge the traditional country that we gather on this evening. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And to other elders here tonight, I say welcome. So in our traditional language, Wurundjika. Wurundjika is welcome. So Wurundjika Nyeman Kundibik, Wurundjiri Wurundjika, which means welcome to the traditional country of the Wurundjika clans of the Wurundjika people. Ramadan Mubarak. <laughs>